again, everyone. Thank you for, for still being with us for the, for the second panel of the, of the conversation today. We are going to actually take over some of the themes and issues and ideas that were already, have already been expressed um, in, in, the, in the earlier panel. We'll continue to discuss about, about the Black Sea, about the greater Black Sea. We are going to continue to look at the south, south of Turkey, um, and, and, and the, south, the southern region as well looking into the security threats and vulnerabilities of the greater Black Sea region, as I was saying. And when we, mean, when we say greater and expanded, we don't only mean geographically, we also will be looking at the uh, vulnerabilities which are not only military, hard military, but also which have to do with domestic resilience or lack of it, um, with other domestic factors that do affect security, and with less traditional security threats, which all the hybrid um, uh, threats which, which, uh, which are all, all across the region, or all across the two regions, rather, if you really want to split it this way. Um, and from the geographical point of view, I will start, it will make absolutely no sense, but I will start with Georgia, then move north to Ukraine, then sandwich Romania between, and then end with, uh, uh, with Turkey. To do, a, to do a tour of the, uh, of the entire region. As such, I would like to start with, uh, with Batu Kutelia, who is the uh, Vice President of the Atlantic Council in Georgia. And I will do enforce a five minute rule because we have, we have five speakers and only a limited amount of time. And I'm sure there are gonna be many, many questions from the, uh, from the participants. So Batu, please go ahead and tell us how you see the vulnerabilities and threats from, from Georgia. And again, do not only refer to military traditional threats, but other threats as well. Um, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, here with you. And thanks for the organizers for a very timely event uh, with the upcoming NATO summit, but also a lot of uh, turmoil going on uh, in and around democracies. Uh, I will try to uh, briefly uh, uh, throw some ideas how we, from the Georgian perspective, see the, the current uh, uh, security environment. Uh, with a lot of problems that has been widely discussed here, uh, uh, this, I think, are the result of the two unfinished jobs. And these two unfinished jobs uh, were the complete institutional dissolution of the Soviet Union, and uh, enlargement of the Europe as a Europe whole and free and end peace. These processes stopped somewhere uh, near the end, but still did not finish. And therefore, uh, if we compare the 2008 and 2018, after 10 years of the uh, Bucharest summit, <coughs> while the security environment at that time was rather benign and we have a more hostile uh, security environment, also the a process of uh, uh, building or consolidating the uh, democracies and the free world uh, has moved from the proactive mood uh, uh, to the more reactive mood. And that caused a lot of uh, problems for us because the fighting or the confrontation front moved towards our side. Uh, now we see a lot of debate that uh, we have to save the uh, uh, old uh, liberal world order because it's undermined by Putin. Uh, and uh, there is another argument uh, that uh, we cannot say what, uh, what was the old order. We have to save the old values, that's a freedom and democracy, uh, but we have to create a new order. And uh, for this new order, uh, uh, especially uh, from our standpoint, Lexi dimension is a very important one. Very important in many reasons, but again, referring to the famous 2008, first clear demonstration of the uh, challenge of the old order uh, was the Russian invasion in Georgia in the summer of 2008, and then the, all the other famous events followed it. Uh, and uh, since the Black Sea is a very important component of the uh, new uh, order that needs to be created for European security and the wider uh, security environment. Uh, first of all, the most important thing is to have a common understanding of the uh, threats or the common threat perception. 
In that regard, the Warsaw Summit was, NATO Warsaw Summit was a very interesting milestone where first time Russia was labeled as an, uh, one of the major threats rather than a potential uh, partner. But also this summit was important for, from our perspective because uh, if you read the communique of the Warsaw Summit, you see Black sea mentioned eight times in five different paragraphs. Uh, in relation to the freedom, democracy, uh, fighting terrorism, uh, wider Middle East strategy, military component, etc. So, uh, having all this in mind, then there is a three major components of the uh, future uh, successful strategy that needs to be implemented. And this strategy uh, should be targeting uh, so-called Russia's anti-excess excess denial policy, but not only the military one. The more successful uh, anti-excess excess denial policy is a political one that Russia is trying to create by undermining the democracy, undermining trust towards the Western values and uh, seeding the apathy. In different countries, they employ different tactics. That's a uh, nature of the hybrid warfare. But what we clearly see is that this hybrid warfare is uh, operating on a, uh, if you, we use the IT terminology, uh, system of the artificial intelligence. This hybrid warfare self-learning in different countries and progressing. So the strategy that should uh, counter this type of hybrid warfare in every potential front in our countries, including Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, and in the wider Black Sea, uh, should consist uh, and should be in synchronization with the Western strategy, but should consist on three key components. The first is the Europe uh, strong and free, uh, consolidating the core of Europe in terms of the understanding of the key values. The second is uh, stabilization of the Europe styles, which is also the source of the problem, internal problems, uh, for the democracies, and Russia quite successfully tries to employ its uh, hybrid tools in that part of the world to create problems for the Europe and boost eastern frontiers. And in terms of the boosting eastern frontier, the Black Sea region, in wider its understanding, has a key role, as well as the strengthening the south. So, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, strengthening or boosting the eastern frontier, there is a two major di dimensions, that's an internal and external. External dimension has been discussed in the previous panel as well, it's a more military, hardcore security component, uh, rising the cost of the aggression, um, uh, military deterrence, containment, all this Cold War terminology which already came to play, but more importantly also this strengthening the Eastern Frontiers uh, from the inside. And in that regard, the fighting corruption, uh, target, uh, targeting the uh, Russian kind of a leverage of the uh, conflicts uh, and rethinking uh, the approach towards the conflict, uh, creating a new momentum for different creative approaches to the solving this problem is very important. And in this regard, to boost this type of internal resilience of uh, uh, countries who are on the front line of this uh, hybrid uh, uh, warfare, uh, one of the key components, I think, is a further NATO enlargement as a continuation of the unfinished job that I mentioned in the beginning. Of course, the uh, uh, arguments we all, all the time hear is that we are not ready, time is not right, it's not realistic, focus on something else. Well, time is right, we are ready, and if we don't uh, focus on NATO enlargement, then we will not be able to focus on anything else because that's uh, it's a, being in a reactive mode is a defensive mode. And of course, it requires leadership. I personally think that the US political leadership will be decisive in this uh, approach, especially uh, mounting the uh, more strong strategic uh, interest and the uh, presence on the Black Sea, physical presence, economic, military, political. And uh, in, the, in the end of my comments, I think it's the uh, right time also to bring uh, freedom and democracy on offensive, quoting Margaret Thatcher. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, but you did really open up a lot of, of, of fronts, so to speak, um, talking about um, the, uh, the, the interference that Russia has in all of these countries, the lack of resilience, uh, the attack to democracy, if you want, but also you threw in the um, hybrid warfare and the use of artificial intelligence, so really a wide spectrum of issues that Sergei would now have to pick up on. And uh, when you do talk from, from, from your Ukrainian perspective, obviously, also, please do refer about resilience in the country. 
resilience in the country. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to this forum and for the opportunity to share some of my ideas. And uh, <clears throat> I have five minutes, so I will probably use it to, to give five messages and to tackle the issues that were already tackled, but from the different angle. So, uh, first message is related to Crimea. It was already mentioned here that Crimea turned, converted fr fr from the peninsula to the Russian aircraft carrier and to the Russian missile carrier. And we've uh, mentioned more than once that uh, in Crimea can be used as a platform for projecting Russian power. Uh, however, there is one issue that was not tackled by the previous speakers. It's the issue of human security in Crimea, which is also very important because sometimes at the security conferences we overlook that besides being converted into aircraft and missile carrier, it's a place where people live and where people are prosecuted for their political views, for their uh, uh, roots. Uh, I, I mean ethnic roots, uh, I mean Crimean Tatar people uh, who are prosecuted politically in, in, in Crimea, and I, I mean uh, pro-Ukrainian activists and Ukrainians prosecuted in, in Crimea, not to mention uh, uh, the case of Oleg Sentsov, who is currently on hunger strike in Russia, who is imprisoned for political reasons. And uh, I, I would really encourage the international audience to pay attention to the issue of human rights organizations excess denial to Crimea because it's not only excess denial in, in military terms, it's also excess denial in terms of human rights. Uh, second issue that I wanted to, to, to comment on is the problem of another sea which is getting into the Russian lake and that's the Sea of Azov which, which is definitely should be mentioned in the context of wider Black Sea security and uh, in the Sea of Azov, uh, we have first the obstacle of uh, New Bridge, which uh, limits the access of uh, vessels to, to the Azov Sea ports of Ukraine. Plus, we have uh, the so-called flotilla of so-called uh, Donetsk People's Republic, which is just five cutters, but anyway, now it is uh, supported by, by the Russian uh, naval vessels coming fr from Caspian flotilla. Uh, then uh, my third message uh, related to the region in general would be about the frozen conflicts and the threat of inflaming them. That's indeed a threat, but from the other perspective there is a problem of uh, improper settlement of frozen conflicts. And we had just, just recently we had a Rome meeting of 5 plus 2 format, which is labeled to be successful but which brings to the agenda pretty, pretty controversial issues, like recognizing the place of Transnistrian Republic, recognizing the diplomas of Transnistrian Republic, and so steps uh, which, uh, which lead to indirect recognition of Transnistrian Republic and so-called Transnistrian Republic, the secessionist region of the Republic of Moldova, and that's the precedent which can be further used for the other cases of, uh, of frozen conflicts or of flaming conflicts like we do have in Ukraine. So that's my third message. And message number four is related to vulnerability of the countries of the region. And just recently we released the index of uh, resilience to Russian disinformation, which covered uh, 14 countries uh, of Eastern Partnership, Black Sea and Baltic Sea. And the most vulnerable country in this, uh, in this regard is the Republic of Moldova. And we have the elections in the Republic of Moldova this fall, and therefore, like, there is a need to be ready for bad surprises in the Republic of Moldova. Besides, I also conducted the research on other kinds of vulnerabilities, and uh, I noticed uh, that uh, if we compare the curves of uh, political stability, the curves of economic development, and uh, uh, 
different uh, stability indexes produced by international organizations, then the data that we have in Moldova this year and the previous year is pretty close to the data that we had in Ukraine in 2013, 2014, which means that from the perspective of uh, vulnerability to hybrid threats, Moldova is very vulnerable country of the region. And my fifth message would be that mm, Indeed, uh, like the countries uh, are very vulnerable, but the additional vulnerability is caused that the big powers, the main actors, are starting to be involved in, in global issues, more than Black Sea issues, and that might eventually cause the, the, the fact that Black Sea region would be the issue for bargaining. And in this regard, uh, I would strongly recommend uh, us to stay together, to have a common stand as the countries of the region. And uh, because of that, we, we can make our voice stronger. We have good initiatives between uh, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. And we do appreciate Romanian uh, approach toward this and the fact that Romania provides a platform for, for our countries to, to be heard in, in NATO countries and in the EU countries. And probably I will stop here. Thank you very much. And uh, you did mention Romania, so we'll definitely move, uh, move on to Romania. But also Batu brought up uh, something which I think is very int interesting, which is looking to see if the countries in the region, in the greater Black Sea region, do have a common threat perception. They understand threat and they see threat when it comes to security, obviously, um, in the same way, or at least in the same, you know, potential, uh, potential adversaries. Um, Romania was mentioned, Georgia, so do you want to pick up from there and uh, also when it comes to cooperation in the region, I think Romania has done quite and is doing quite a lot to enhance security, security cooperation um, uh, when it comes to the eastern flank, but not only. So, uh, Georgia Chamba, you want to say something about uh, how Romania sees threats and how Romania sees cooperation? Thank you so much, and thank you so much for inviting me. I think, you know, Aspen is one of the, Aspen in the Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs was one of the first to highlight the importance of the Black Sea a lot before everybody else was uh, putting the Black Sea on the geopolitical map. Uh, you know, I think we, we, we are facing now a situation you know, that, you know, we, we uh, in the Black Sea region, what we are looking for from a Romanian angle is, first of all, that we need to show full solidarity and cohesion of all the NATO member states, which are repairing on the Black Sea. I think this is of the utmost important, is that Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey would have a common view on the security on the Black Sea. Uh, on the other hand, we have to recognize that uh, there is a complete change you just have to look on the map and to see where Crimea is, to see that, you know, we have a completely different sea, uh, Black Sea, than we used to have in terms of strategic and geopolitical. On the other hand, as well, the type of actions we are seeing on the Black Sea has changed in nature. It's not just about, you know, you know uh, speaking about conference, it's, it's about concrete breach of territorial waters. I think Russia is not only active in the sense of the uh, repair of the country uh, of occupying Crimea and uh, the conflict in Ukraine, but it's as well active on the Black Sea itself. Uh, then we are facing as well other type of challenges. I think there is a lot of challenges which are related to the environment that nobody speaks about, and it's uh, we were for many years advocating in the Union to have a strategy on the Black Sea which would be based on common standards and common denominators. Uh, as uh, we speak now, still, you know, I think that there is a lot more focus these days, for example, on the south, and we still have more focus on the eastern Mediterranean that we, sh that we have on the Black Sea. I think, the, in a way, what we should try to, you know, to, to put forward is a more integrated vision, a more holistic vision, which, you know, speaks about the extended Black Sea region, first of all, and, you know, speaks as well the relationship between, you know, the Black Baltic and the Black Sea when it comes to the eastern flank, but as well the relationship between the Black Sea and the eastern Mediterranean when it comes to the way, you know, Russia is playing, and not only, 
because in a way, you know, you see a lot of deal making and you see a lot of trade going on, uh, which is uh, at the end could. Uh, we, uh, at the end, we are not uh, we are not very clear what is all about, but but be sure that you know the Black Sea is part of the game. So I think it's very important that we show from NATO solidarity that you know the upcoming NATO summit is going to reconfirm. I was happy to see that to uh, to listen to one of my predecessor speakers that you know said the previous NATO summit in Warsaw discovered the Black Sea and put you know the Black Sea on the map in the sense of security threats and the way where NATO should be more ac active from uh, deterrence. And uh, from a deterrence point of view, I think we are looking for that the next NATO summit would confirm it. In the same time, uh, we have to recognize the reality that Russia reinforced its military pre presence not only in, the, in Ukraine, I think it's, it's as well in the other, we have other phenomena related in the break in the breakaway regions we have a lot of uh, uh, protracted conflicts that became quite hot uh, in a way uh, you know by uh, by what we have seen in the last days with Syria recognizing these uh, uh, entities in a way proved uh, the thing that I mentioned before, that there is a full relationship between the Black Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, from our perspective, we are taking our measure. We should not forget Romania is doing its part. And I think the way Romania is strengthening security and uh, deterrence is by uh, spending. I think, you know, the military spending of Romania, the 2% the spending, I think it's a proof in itself of how so how is the best approach and what we have to do in order to strengthen NATO on the shores of the Black Sea? I think, you know, our military capabilities as well are uh, military planning, and I think uh, the Chief of General Staff, General Stuka, told you before, are taking into account as well the new geopolitical situation on the Black Sea. So in a way, I think they, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a thing that we would not see before uh, so to, to be so... Uh, cohesive and you know politically very united when it comes to spending the two percent it's one of the issues that in Romania I think has a large consensus one of the reason is that we have seen the threat and the threat became clear for all to see so I think you know so you have to take thing we have to take things in our hands but in the same time we have to enhance the collective security and solidarity because you know an alliance what the main the main feature of an alliance and the military alliance is cohesion and solidarity. You know, it's about how you can uh, uh, defend the others, how you can run to defend the others, how you can create the corridors to defend the others. As well, we are saluting the fact that what would be helpful for all of us, and of course, in terms of NATO members on the Black Sea, is the concept of military mobility, which has been taken by the European Union. And this is a really a step in the right direction because of course there are things we can do on the you know the black sea it's a special sea in a way is ruled by the uh, by the montreal convention there are things that you can do there are things that you cannot do i think it's very important to strengthen as well the land dimension of nato and uh, how you can move and support uh, any other member states through the through the land uh, so Roger, can i can i just interrupt you right right here because you did say okay. something which is extremely interesting and, and you kept referring to 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 cohesion and solidarity and i do want to pass the, the button to dudu to pick up on this on cohesion and solidarity um around the black sea but not only around the extended black sea so that also involves the the uh, the eastern flank there is the eastern flank summit coming up in warsaw in two days if i'm not mistaken and our president the romanian president along with the others uh, is going to attend the, uh, the Eastern Flank Summit. But tell me a little bit how you see the cohesion and solidarity between NATO members, not only those around the Black Sea, but also those, the older, um, you know, NATO members when it comes to the Black Sea security. I presume that you, not, uh, you do not read my, uh, my uh, words here. <laughs> um, um, good morning. So for today to hear you. Um, initially, the, the panel had uh, had another title, Black Sea in the big, Bigger Picture. 
I will stick to the bigger picture. It's easier than the Black Sea. Um, I, I wanted at the beginning to cover three issues, the trans community, some vulnerabilities in Europe and uh, Russia limits. But because, but because everyone speak about, speak about here, but everyone covered uh, Russia, I will forget about uh, Russia. And because of the five minutes Alina gave it to me, I, will, I hope that I'll be able to stay on the two issues. Uh, from my point of view, there is no alternative to the strengthening of the you know, trans relationship, which is an overwhelming uh, importance for the very existence of the Western uh, democratic civilization. Uh, a, a European Union cannot fully assure its security in a broader sense without the United States. Equally, the United States need a united and strong European Union for the, uh, exactly the same reason. Uh, maybe it's a little bit naive in, in, uh, in this um, new trade war environment to say that, but you know the saying, uh, water flows. Uh, there are alternatives to this transatlantic community. Uh, obviously, yes. I love uh, very much one of those. It's um, in a re recent paper on the Valdai Group. It's true speaking about the um, Middle East. The title was The Harmony of the Polyphony. And I believe no, nobody in this very room and, uh, has problem in who is the composer and the conductor at the same time. There is another, there, there is another alternative to that. It's the 16, 16 plus one China uh, proposition. It's, uh, uh, if you look to, that, uh, to, the look, uh, to how it is designed, this, this uh, uh, strategy, you, bel you believe that the, by far the best readers, Mackinder, European and central pivotal place um, uh, in, in uh, Europe and Asia are, are the Chinese. The other one is the easy pace of uh, individual solution, state individual solution, we, and we have some of them, and uh, um, obviously self-keeper. Uh, uh, and there are some more likewise, but I don't believe that this is, uh, that is our problem. Our problem it's how to reaff reaffirm the transatlantic community values and how to defend them. How to make NATO and the EU defense ambition to fit together, strengthen the best, of, the best of each and not jeopardizing and any competitive advantage both organizations have in this Brexit in environment. Uh, if we look to the scare resources that we have, there is no such a problem to choose between the two organizations. The answer for the question is complementarity and avoiding overlapping. It is very difficult to believe that the NATO and the EU member state will, like, uh, will act otherwise. Now, some of, something about some of the vulnerabilities and uh, threats in Europe. I, 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 will, I will say, uh, first of all, uh, about my main concern. 1989 was a stalemate, but everyone believed that it was a, democracy, a victory, a democracy victory. For, from some countries in Eastern Europe, including Romania, it was so. NATO and EU membership uh, is a seal of that. However, democracy is not a stage, it's a process. We need a constant struggle for values and commitments emerging from autonomous association which flourish only in the, uh, when they grow from below. But we gain fat, and we forgot that. Consequently, in Western Europe, traditional political party lost the idea of uh, accountability, entrusting bureaucracy with too much power and paving so the way to the populist and far left and far right wing parties, the Europe's populist surge. In the other hand, in, in Eastern Europe, where democracy is still in his ten, teenage years, we. Yeah, we invented high liberalism and new scheme of leading by proxy a country. It's a very good article in, uh, in The Economist today. I do not believe that there is in this very room someone to, to need to emphasize the democracy significance for the security and the political parties and accountability for a strong democracy. This is my main concern, the European political landscape. I will mention some others. First of all, it's the middle class downsizing. It's by far the, the best, the great support of the democracy. 
society at, uh, to, uh, atomization in this internet era and anything that came under the hybrid concept umbrella. Here, there are, I will mention just two issues. It, uh, everyone mentioned here the resilience, the, the resilience of the society, but I will go further to say that the resi resilience of the ordinary citizen is by far more significant in the end. We, we should start to build up uh, 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 this re re resilience in the, from the elementary school. And secondly, because, because Georgia mentioned the mobility, the mobility issue in Europe, where we should have a very good collaboration between NATO and AU. I will mention here a very good example in a very small scale, it's true, the hybrid uh, center of excellence in uh, Helsinki, which is a legal uh, entity from, uh, Finnish, uh, uh, from Finland, but it was, uh, it was covered by Stoltenberg at the East inauguration, Stoltenberg and Mogherini in the same time. Another one, another one, I, uh, just, just let me, one, one, 30, uh, seconds. 30 seconds. Western Balkans, nobody mentioned here, the Western Balkans. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, the, the second one, the last one, it's the uh, potential unnatural between uh, division between South and Eastern uh, NATO and uh, EU flanks. Na uh, Georgia mentioned one, so. And here we have B9 and three Cs very good initiative in order to, uh, to link together those two, I should say front, not flank, flank, it's okay. Okay. Um, speaking about links, I do want to move on to the, to, the, to the last speaker on the panel. Speaking about links, linking the two flanks, and also speaking about cohesion between uh, all of the NATO members, um, I do want to turn to, to, to Turkey and do tell us a little bit about how security of the Black Sea region is being seen from Turkey, what the, what the threats um, and vulnerabilities are, um, are there as seen from Turkey. And also this, this important role that Turkey is playing to link the two, the two flanks, if you want, or the two, uh, the two uh, regions, rather. Again, you do have five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would also like to thank the Aspen Institute and the German Marshall Fund for the invitation and uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to share my ideas. Uh, actually, if you talk about the security uh, environment uh, in Turkey, everybody will uh, I mean, talk about the Syria case. Uh, this is the issue now in Turkey now. And in the previous session, as my colleague mentioned, uh, Turkish uh, policy uh, towards Syria evolved uh, since the beginning of the Arab Spring and now we have much more a security oriented uh, policy uh, towards Syria. Of course it is not totally related with the security of the Black Sea region but indirectly of course it has implications uh, and mostly negative implications towards the security of the Black Sea region. And the border of Turkey, the southern border of Turkey, uh, on the other hand, is also a NATO uh, border, the southern eastern border of the NATO. So in that regard, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's a huge issue, not, also, not only for Turkey, but also uh, NATO and its uh, allies. So what are the Turkish uh, security concerns and priorities regarding Syria? And I mainly classify these uh, concerns and priorities into five main topics. Uh, which are uh, the fight against terrorism. Uh, and uh, under this topic, uh, there are three subtopics, which are YPG, the extension of PKK, a terrorist organization, the, the ISIS, and also the Al-Qaeda elements, which are mainly uh, settled in the, on the Turkish uh, border uh, area. The second one is the possible disintegration of Syria, which might also affect the Turkish political unity and territorial integrity in the midterm and long term. Third one, the border security. Uh, as we lack state authority on the other side of the border, in Syria uh, we have problems with the border uh, security issue. The refugee issue uh, is the fourth uh, topic. And lastly, the political solution to Syria uh, crisis, because it has become a big issue which has vast spillover effects, which I already mentioned now, uh, towards uh, Turkey, so that we need an urgent uh, solution uh, to the Syrian crisis. Regarding the fight against terrorism, 
Uh, first of all, YPG, uh, which controls nearly one third of the Syrian uh, territory. And in coordination with the US uh, army, uh, they now had become a very prominent actor of the Syrian uh, civil war. And as they are an extension of the PKK, Turkey considers this uh, advancement of YPG as an existential threat to its security uh, and saw so that doing its best to eliminate the YPG uh, and its uh, affiliated elements in the northern, northern, eastern uh, Syria. Uh, in that regard, uh, as my colleague mentioned, we conducted some military operations, uh, the Uprated Shield operation and also the Operation Olive Branch, uh, but it's not over. Uh, secondly, the ISIS, since the establishment of the, the Turkish Republic, we faced the biggest terrorist act attacks, uh, which was uh, conducted by uh, ISIS, so that it is also another security concern uh, for Turkey. For the time being, it is contained, not finished, but it is contained, I should say, uh, as uh, ISIS, also not only Turkish efforts, but the coalition efforts, ISIS is squeezed in the eastern side of Syrian desert so that uh, we can say that it is uh, contained and lastly the Al-Qaeda elements There are no direct confrontation between Turkey and Al-Qaeda But uh, we think that uh, as they are settled on the Turkish border in the me in time there could be some kind of security concerns and uh, maybe some terrorist attacks against Turkey So this is uh, another concern secondly the possible disintegration uh, by de facto means, we see that Syria had partitioned into three, mainly. Uh, on the one hand, U.S. and YPG controlled areas on the east, and Turkish influence zone on the northwest and the regime areas. Uh, we can divide it into two. On the, on the west, the Russian influence and the other areas are under Iranian influence. So if this de facto disintegration uh, transforms into a legal one, this might also... Uh, threaten Turkish political unity and territorial integrity, so we are very concerned about the uh, disintegration of Syria. Can, Thirdly, can the border... I, can I please ask you something? You, sure. you, have, you have one more minute, so please to try to refer to the Black Sea as well in this, in this last minute. <laughs> last minute, okay. Uh, the border security, the foreign terrorist fighters, you know that more than 100 uh, countries from more than 100 countries, uh, ISIS fighters and also YPG fighters uh, crossed the border from Turkey and it had become a security threat for Turkey. And the refugee issue, we host nearly three and a half million Syrians in our uh, country so that Turkey tries to prevent more refugee influxes and we need an urgent uh, political solution. What is the Turkish response? Military operations inside Syria, as I mentioned. Increasing the more border measures, using techno technological means, and also establishing walls on the whole border area. Turkish-Syria border is nearly uh, 910 uh, kilometers. We are also, uh, regarding the political solution, we are an active partner of the Astana process in coordination with the Russians and the Iranians, and also the Geneva uh, process, which is a more inclusive one, including the Gulf countries and the Western uh, partners. And as Russia had become the power broker in Syria in order to eliminate our security uh, threats, we started a cooperation uh, with the Russians and thanks to that uh, cooperation, uh, we enabled uh, to eliminate terror risks. But as my colleague mentioned, this is not something strategic and this does not depend on mutual uh, trust. Uh, this is like a give and take uh, relationship between uh, Turkey and uh, Russia. Uh, but Turkish inclination towards Russia mostly depends on the not NATO's and mostly the U.S. position towards uh, Turkey, and it is related with the U.S. Army's support uh, to YPG. And unless this support continues, we could uh, see that Turkey will be more tend to move with the Russians uh, inside uh, Syria. I mean, I have. Uh, some more comments, but uh, I think I have to finish here. Maybe we can continue yeah, maybe in the Q&A session. In Thank the, you for in the discussion. For. And with this, I do want to turn to the room and to the participants. And do please make your comments and or preferably ask questions to the panelists. And I will ask my colleagues to pass on some microphones so we can hear the questions. Let me start here. And... Okay, and then you. Okay, thank you very much, Sinaya. 
Uh, my name is Evren Güner. I'm representing the Turkish Embassy. I'm a political counselor. Uh, thank you very much for this timely discussion. Uh, I'd like to clarify a couple of issues from the Turkish official point of view. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to extend an objection, uh, a mild one at that, uh, to, the, to the way the discussions have been framed here uh, today, because it's been overly claimed in the uh, working papers that Turkey uh, that there are challenges coming from Turkey. Well, I think, uh, we think that this is a, a, a misunderstanding. Well, since Turkey finds itself in the forefront uh, of the alliance, uh, and mostly Turkey is the first country to face many of the challenges that, that, uh, that the alliance has to uh, face. Uh, Turkey has proven that it's a staunch ally of NATO for over... 75 years and time and again we have proven our worth and um, especially when push comes to shove and uh, both in terms of our commitments and uh, and our con contributions budgetary or military and uh, thirdly i'd like to address uh, to the claims of rapprochement uh, between turkey and russia uh, from where uh, mostly the criticisms em emerge and that's correct but uh, you ha one has to keep in mind that Turkey and Russia are um, mo more, I mean, most important and very important and interdependent actors, both in terms of uh, security now in Syria and economy, uh, economically and in terms of energy. So we should find a modus vivendi, as we all know that dialogue uh, is with deterrence and defense and other posture that NATO recognizes as a method. So this doesn't mean necessarily that Turkey does not recognize Russian aggression as such. And we, uh, we always make it clear that we support Ukrainian and Georgian territorial integrity. And we make it clear to our, when we, uh, when we cons converse with our Russian counterparts. Uh, so what we need and what we expect is more appreciation for what Turkey has done for the alliance and more multilateral decision-making within the alliance, taking allies, individual, uh, national securities in consideration as well. Thank, Thank you very you. much for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thank you for this intervention. I do have one more question here, and the, the gentleman needs a microphone. And then if there is another microphone to pass to the gentleman in the back, that would be very good. Another person from Turkey, again, Muzaffer. Şenel from Istanbul Şehir University, Director for Center of Modern, Modern Turkish Studies. Actually, that to your question is about what they want to give an answer to your question about uh, the security perceptions from Black Sea. It's Turkey is anticipating mostly about the energy resources rather than the, all other issues. That the energy dependence on Russia is the main concern in the, the Turkish energy. Let's say Turkish actually the, the, in the political, let's say the, the consultancies or all these diplomatic track to diplomacy meetings. That this is the main concern. The second one is about the no one mentioned you're about going the to give a, withdrawal of the Russian. You're giving an answer or asking a question yeah, because the, the one, qu one comment and then the question. The second okay. one is about the Russian withdrawal from the, the uh, Akka Accords, which is the main threat for Turkey. That the, the Russia is going to be more deployment on Caucasus, the military deployment on Caucasus, which is Turkey is going to be clamping in the Russian uh, clamp that it's going to be a more, more, uh, let's say, secure threat for Turkey, military threat to Turkey rather than to the electronic war. And my questions to the OITUN that how do you see that the, this uh, withdrawal of Russian uh, 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 to, from the, the um, Akka Accords, the deployments, the military deployments on Caucasus, how will be affect the Turkish let's say, territorial integrity, since they have the claims on steel. Okay, thank you. Uh, somebody has the microphone, no? Right, no, not you, Emma. You have to pass it on to the person who wants to ask a question. Thank and you very then much. In, in front. Uh, Christian Gitzer, parliamentary advisor. Um, my question again points to uh, the uh, Turkish uh, position and it questions the, what is the end game for Turkey in the Kurdish situation? So when will Turkey consider that its uh, security um, needs are no longer threatened. Um, I've recently read that there is an agreement between uh, Turkey and America for the withdrawal of Kurdish uh, soldiers from uh, Mambij. Will that be enough? Is there more that needs to be done? And if 
uh, the Kurdish situation is being resolved, uh, the tensions between the allies, between, mainly between Turkey and the United States, be resolved. Thank you. Thank you. There was, yeah. Uh, I have a question. And then me. the lady there, okay. please. Uh, for Mr. Ionescu. Uh, uh, the question is about uh, the region of Dobroja and the uh, missing uh, important uh, investments in there. Uh, it is a concern about the security of uh, the region in the missing investments in, uh, of major investments in Dobroja mm -hmm. or it just a political issue regarding the government and the policies of the development of the region. Take two more questions, the lady who has the microphone, and then another one in the back. Okay. Thank you very much. Ivnat uh, Rashlashvili from Georgia. Uh, the short question regarding the Black Sea region belt uh, that represents five out of six countries, as it was mentioned in previous session, that have problems or territorial problems with uh, Russia. So, what do you think if uh, Syria already recognized a few days ago? Uh, breakaway regions of Georgia's independent states, if Syria does the same w towards the other states, I mean Moldova, Ukraine, uh, and Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and so on. Thank you very much. Okay, and the last question. Hello, I'm Valentin Rupa for the National Ministry of Defense uh, Trust uh, Media, Media Trust. I have a question for Mr. Oytun Orhan. We've talked about the cooperation between Turkey and the Russian Federation bilaterally, especially in Syria. And uh, I know that there, has, there has been some cooperation concerning the weapon systems and economic trades between the two parties. And in this broad context, it's a simple yes or no question actually. Is Turkey still a reliable NATO partner in the Black Sea region? Okay, thank you. A lot of questions about Turkey. So Itun, you have the floor. First of all, maybe we have to uh, clarify that it is the problem is not the Kurdish corridor or the Kurdish entity in Syria. It is the PKK corridor. So it is better to define it as a terror uh, corridor because uh, as all we know, we have very good relations with the KRG, Iraqi Kurdistan uh, government. Uh, so. Uh, we have a strat we used to have before the referendum a strategic alliance uh, with that uh, government so the problem is not the kurdish itself but the terrorist uh, organization what is the end game of course turkey from my point of view as an analyst uh, i could easily say that turkey will not stop unless uh, the ypg control rule in syria ends and will it be enough uh, yesterday, uh, our foreign minister and Pompeo met, and uh, they tried to finalize the Mambic deal. And uh, under in that context, probably the YPG elements will withdraw from Mambic. Yes, that's enough. As I said, the problem is not uh, the U.S. military; it's our NATO ally. There's no problem with the U.S. military entity inside Syria, but the problem is the U.S. military's support to a terrorist uh, organization, which is uh, YPG. That's the problem, and in that, and if uh, two armies could find find a way to cooperate together, the Mambic model could be easily applied to the east of Syria, and Mambic will not be the last uh, stop, I should say. Uh, Unless the YPG control in the east of Syria is not eliminated, Turkey will not stop. Uh, Turkey is asking to do it in coordination with U.S. Probably they will find a way to do it. But if not, as I said, as I mentioned, as Russians had become the power broker in uh, Syria, Turkey will try to look for uh, some uh, uh, alternatives. Uh, for Dr. Muzaffer's question, uh, Dr. Muzaffer, you mentioned about the deployment of Russian military, Russian military in? in Caucasus. In Caucasus. How does Turkey? Well, it's not. Uh, well, well, it's not my expertise area, so I would leave it to my probably may uh, our uh, Turkish diplomat or our Turkish colleague who is uh, expert on those issues. And uh, lastly, is Turkey is still a reliable partner of NATO. This totally depends on the NATO's and U.S. approach. 
This is it not was Turkish. a yes or no question. Of course, as, yes. As the no, I, I shouldn't say yes. Yeah, I mean, gentleman it's, it's asked. It's not a yes or no. Yes, of course, it is still. But from the Turkish point of view, yeah. is NATO is still, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, reliable to support Turkish security concerns. We have lots of security concerns originating from Syria, as I mentioned. And uh, in Turkish public opinion, and this is not related with the Turkish government, uh, this is a real disappointment within, within Turkish public that NATO is not helping Turkish uh, concerns. Uh, you know, we had terror attacks, as my colleague mentioned, there are ISIS uh, missile attacks towards our border towns and uh, with Turkish pressure, some Patriot mis uh, systems were deployed, but then withdrawn. So there's a disappointment. We, we expect more from our NATO allies. So this is a question of not Turkey, but the NATO, our US ally. And Tur as I said, the US support to the YPG and European countries' uh, approach towards the Kurdish militia in Syria is also disappointing uh, the Turkish uh, public opinion. So this is not a question of Turkey, but maybe uh, NATO. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Um, Batu, you wanted to say something, and then the other panelists, if you do want to say anything, because we'll have to close the panel. We're moving on directly into the next one. So Batu, please go. Uh, yes. Uh, it's working? Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, very brief comment. Uh, the Turkey has been discussed uh, a lot, and it's a clear indication that uh, Turkey is uh, one of the most important uh, strategic uh, country in the Black Sea region. And while there is a lot of tactical uh, issues, sometimes in contradiction, sometimes it needs a little bit more fine-tuning, there is a one issue uh, where on the Black Sea, Turkey, United States, and other uh, Black Sea uh, regional countries strongly agree, and Turkey has been very vocal about it, it's a Georgia's NATO membership. So I think that's a very important uh, uh, manifestation from Turkey's side, the supporting a more NATO role in the Black Sea, while of course the US strategic leadership is uh, also important. And while these two coincide, I think we have a realistic chances to do so. Thank you, Sergei. Did you want to add anything? Final thoughts? Just a very brief comment about recognition of uh, secessionist entities by Syria and the possible follow-ups. Uh, here I, I have to say that first, uh, we have like different approaches of Russian Federation itself to towards secessionist regions. Uh, like in case of uh, Georgia, they are recognized by Russia. In case of Transnistria, they are not recognized. And in case of Ukraine, they are next. So, so it's like different, different approaches. And uh, uh, in case of Georgia, it was definitely the deficit of United Western action, which led to the consequences. And in order to prevent recognition of these entities by Russia and then follow up recognition by other Russian satellites. We do need this United Western action. Thank you. Georgia, did you want to pick up on any of the issues? No, just to say that, you know, of course, there was a lot of focus on Turkey. In a way, I think we should change the name of the panel for the next time. I think Turkey and NATO. Uh, I just want to underline uh, coming to you know, I think, you know, it's, uh, of course, solidarity is a two-way street, but we should recognize that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have to stay together when uh, the threat is greater. And, you know, in the Black Sea, what I can say as well to the Turkish and our Bulgarian friends, clearly they acknowledge and recognize that the level of threat has become greater. So there is, and there is a level of instability that is moving towards us. So I think we should not mix, you know, one of the things about the alliance should not mix domestic issues with security. I think uh, we, can, uh, we can never justify the lack of solidarity because of domestic politics or disappointment. I think it's very important uh, to understand that this is a statement on values. NATO is not only about security, it's about the kind of values and how, what kind of things we can, uh, uh, we can do and things that we cannot do. So I think that it's very important that we stay together. And on the Black Sea, I think it's very important that we give a signal that the NATO allies on the Black Sea are able to come together and to sort out all the issues. And they, there is not going to be a weaker link, because if it's going to be a weaker link, 
we should not fool ourselves. Russia is going to take advantage of it. Thank, Thank you. you. First of, I'm so sorry. Uh, first of all, because uh, Dobroja, it has its very, um, its significance military. Mention only MK uh, and all of the, the naval bases. Uh, secondly, the uh, economical in Harbor Constanza by itself, it's a, it's an investment. Uh, and if you look at the dwelling uh, prices now in Constanza, you'll see that they are by far. Uh, but the, the fastest rate, rate on, on uh, growing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the price of the dwelling. So this is a sign of uh, uh, good economical, uh, economic progress. But the point here is not about Dobroja. The point is how we connect uh, with our uh, poor infrastructure to the rest of Europe. And it's not only economical, it's also military. Um, uh, several times we have exercises and we noticed the, 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 the infrastructure uh, uh, and I mean uh, not by the physical one, legal one and uh, another, uh, others uh, likely, likewise, that uh, are, are the most problematic in that, part of the, uh, in that part of the region. There are some investors here, as far as I know, here in very room, that they want to do some business in uh, Dobrojas as well. Okay, thank you. And, um, and with this, I think we set a record for a five panel, uh, for a five speaker panel in less than an hour. Thank you very much for being extremely cooperative on the time. <laughs> we are moving on to the next panel, so Radu, please. of the GDP political fetish or necessity. I want to thank Alina for this uh, excellent Turkish panel. It was uh, extremely relevant for our uh, subject today. So I am inviting here Arnold Dupuy, which is with us, Bogdan Belchu is also with us, and uh, Stephen Flanagan. We are waiting for Stephen to come. So 2% of the GDP, a political fetish or a necessity, that brings me the occasion to say that Romania is one of the best examples in the alliance in NATO. And four times during the last year, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg mentions Romania about our engagement to spend 2% of the GDP. And that could bring uh, also uh, an example for other allies. Um, if Romania is a good example, then we can discuss not only about the military procurement programs, which is, let's say, the main issue when we are talking about 2% of the GDP, but also about the resilience. Is Romania a resilient NATO member? Can we discuss inside of two those percent of GDP about the resilience, because from my point of view, we have many problems in infrastructure and other sectors of the economy, but in the military field, Romania is of its best evolution ever in the last 27 years since the fall of the communism. And I want to discuss about this um, need of fulfillment of economic, civilian and infra infrastructure resilience together with the military development. And of course, to say to you that the eastern flank is the one to be uh, especially focused on raising 2% of the GDP because the eastern flank is the most exposed on threats. So 
with all being saying, uh, I will ask uh, Bogdan Belch, who is a partner of Pricewaterhouse Romania, to tell us what he thinks about this 2% of the GDP. What do you think it should be for Romanian military and for Romanian economy also? But if we can have an, an example, if Romania could be a lesson learned for other NATO members. Please, Bogdan. Um, so uh, I have a small presentation, if we can put it on. And if you don't mind, I'll also take the, the pointer. So um, our short presentation uh, focuses less on the geopolitics part of the, uh, of the military, uh, but looks more at the economical part. So the idea is when we talk about military expenses, we tend to look at them as expenses, but um, uh, there is a, a strong option to turn those expenses into a source of value added for the economy. And uh, just to share some numbers, I'm sorry that the screen is uh, a little bit far right, uh, but if we look at the global spend for defense, uh, it used to be in the 6% of GDP range in the 60s. Uh, and that gradually declined, uh, and the strongest decline was after the end of the Cold War. Uh, now the world is spending 2.3% of GDP. Uh, that is the, uh, that's at the level of uh, 2017 uh, on defense. If we compare that to Europe, uh, Europe is spending roughly 1.3%. So it's basically half of the amount that uh, is spent at the global level. And within Europe, and actually on the right-hand side, we show not only Europe, but also the countries around the Black Sea. Uh, you see that uh, countries around Black Sea tend to spend more. Uh, Russia, of course, Ukraine, they spend up to 4 or 5% of GDP uh, on defense. Turkey is 1.8%. Romania is, uh, is maybe one of the few areas where we are not on the last two positions in Europe but we only spend about 0.9% compared to the commitment of 2% uh, of GDP for the, next, for the next years. And I fully agree that 2% um, of GDP, given the challenges for the national budget and all the needs of Romania, uh, could, be, could be difficult. We used to spend more. So in 2008, 2010, we were spending quite a bit more in relative terms. The percentage declined by roughly a third in this in this time frame. But now the question is, now this is obviously the net spend, but in many cases, this net spend is offset by revenues which are generated by the industry. Because whenever somebody spends something, somebody else is making a revenue and the profit and value added out of, out of that. Um, <clears throat> now, to start from west to east, if we look at the United States, they are the largest defense spender, but also one of the largest beneficiaries of value added generated in the economy by the um, uh, aerospace and defense industry. So a, a study conducted recently showed that they generate 1.8% of their nominal GDP, uh, which is roughly $301 billion, quite a substantial amount. Um, so that's value added in PIB. Of course, they spend much more than that, but if you look at the net impact, you know, a good part of that is compensated by keeping a part of the uh, value added in the country. 10% um, of U.S. exports uh, were generated by aerospace, um, aerospace and defense, which reduced the trade balance by $85 billion. Uh, more than 1 billion jobs uh, were generated directly and 1.7 indirectly, so 2.7. Uh, uh, million jobs yeah, throughout the country. That's million, not billion, which is 2% of the employment base. And last but not least, uh, research and development. So um, defense, aerospace and defense is one of the areas that generates um, a significant um, amount of uh, research and development. Uh, there's a lot of technology going into today's weapons and missiles and so on. Uh, and that's also a quite substantial amount, about $20 billion uh, in 2017. Now, if we are to look at Europe, <clears throat> obviously we see part of that in Europe as well, uh, but the impact is significantly lower. So obviously when we talk about the economic impact, 
We, on the one hand, we have the prime contractors, which are there on the top, which is um, aeronautic systems, space and missiles, land defense systems, uh, naval industry systems, engine propulsion uh, manufacturers, and so on. So those prime contractors, then they have tier one contractors for specialized systems and uh, subsystems. And then you have tier two contractors, which produce electronics, uh, mechanical parts, metal working, uh, and uh, then commodities and so on. So all in all, there's a value chain, which is quite substantial. And in Europe, that um, uh, benefits to about 1,500 SMEs, of course, concentrated in uh, roughly in six countries. Uh, 0.5 million uh, direct jobs and 1.75, uh, 1.7 uh, indirect jobs, uh, in total jobs. So if you compare that to the US, it's roughly half of the, of the number. And of course, a significant amount of uh, spend and the benefits in the research and development part. Um, in Europe, there's um, quite a, a number of financial support mechanisms which are emerging in order to encourage the, aerof the aerospace and defense industry. Uh, on the one hand, the European Defense Fund uh, started in uh, June 2017. Then industrial development programs um, uh, starting now. But also we see a number of clusters. So if you look around, uh, around Europe, there are about 42 uh, clusters in aerospace in 17 countries which are encouraging knowledge exchange, are pushing innovation, uh, strengthening the EU position in defense, primarily. And from, uh, from now on, uh, there are already uh, grants which are being discussed for those clusters. Uh, on the, if you look at the left-hand side, the numbers are quite substantial. So uh, grants of um, 600 million over a few years, uh, the incentives for joint development of acquisition of defense equipment, um, half a billion for the next two years, one billion per year after 2020, uh, 13 billion in the European defense funds, um, again another half billion uh, and one billion per year for after 2020 in the, the industrial development program. So substantial money which is put aside to further boost the uh, uh, aerospace and defense uh, area. Now moving closer to Romania, another good example is Poland. Uh, in Poland, we see two, uh, two major, um, two major um, areas of interest. On the one hand, uh, the Aviation Valley, which is a, uh, one of the 40-something uh, uh, clusters in Europe. Concentration of uh, about 100 companies uh, active in the aerospace manufacturing, but not only, also research and educational facilities. Uh, employing more than 23,000 employees, which is not much, but it's, uh, uh, we'll see, significantly more than uh, Romania. Uh, that encouraged the, um, uh, the exports. Total exports of the cluster uh, grew from uh, less than a quarter of a billion to two billion euros in 2014. And uh, we see a major presence of large multinational companies active in the field, Sikorsky, West and um, United Technologies, Pratt & Whitney, and so on, uh, which are both on the manufacturing of, um, uh, of products and of components for the aerospace industry. Uh, that is one of the enablers, actually, for the, uh, the defense industry. And uh, we see that uh, Poland has a strong commitment on, the, um, uh, on, on that, on the, in that direction. They committed to more than us, actually 2.5 of GDP by 2030. Of course, a good part of that uh, they can afford by compensating, by generating quite a bit of value from all the companies which are producing that. Uh, how did they get there? They um, basically uh, leverage offset contracts quite well, uh, imposing, enforcing a certain amount of local product in many of their uh, military purchases, but also encouraging transfer of technology, know-how, uh, or license-wise to, to Poland. And they supported or they encouraged the uh, uh, they encouraged foreign investments in the uh, in the industry. Now, where is Romania here? Now, I'm not sure if we managed to capture uh, you know really all the numbers, uh, but uh, we counted about uh, 400 million euros turnover in all the companies dealing in aerospace and defense. Compare that to two billion exports only in Poland, and you'll see is not a very big number. Uh, the aerospace industry grew by roughly 70% in the past three years, so quite a substantial uh, increase. That's cumulative, so across the three years. 
uh, but still generates less than 340 million euros, and that is complemented by companies acting in the defense and weapon manufacturing industries. Uh, which generated revenues of less than a million euros. Many of those companies are the, uh, at the age of break-even. Some of them are actually you know, losing money. And we do have one cluster, uh, but of course more needs to be done in order to get to the level of the Polish cluster. So altogether, um, there is a nucleus on which we can build, but um, uh, and there is a strong, uh, strong potential. Now, of course, uh, one can ask why Romania, because everybody can do that. All the countries can offset some of their military expenses by generating revenues. And I think there are uh, three key elements. One is definitely we do have a strategic role and position uh, in, in Europe and not only. Uh, being a strategic partner for NATO, for Euro, uh, having a, a strong frontier or a large frontier close to uh, frozen conflicts, and there's quite a number of them in the region. We discussed about some of them uh, earlier today. Uh, then we have a key role in the um, common security and defense policy. We are members of lots of uh, uh, centers, uh, institutes, uh, uh, agencies, and so on. We participate actively in two battle groups. Uh, we participated in some of the uh, operational theaters, um, uh, sensitive operational theaters recently. So our, the position, our positioning uh, geopolitically is helping us, uh, but also uh, we did make commitments to uh, allocate uh, about 2% of GDP for 10 years, which is, um, uh, which is another uh, reason why we should uh, be able to, to leverage on that, uh, on that spend. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, as we all know, there's definitely, there, is, uh, there are some um, uh, economic benefits of Romania, uh, a good labor pool, uh, still low cost and so on. Just to, <coughs> uh, to finish, uh, well, there definitely there is a potential, uh, but it doesn't come from granted. Uh, I think there are three major things that need to be done. First, we need to uh, develop a more detailed strategy and really identifying the key areas of focus, our differentiators and our positioning. Uh, second, uh, we need to set up a framework where we need to uh, look at the policies, how the policies need, need um, needs to be uh, readjusted in order to uh, encourage that the legal framework, uh, governance models, operating models, fiscal incentives, and so on. So we need to uh, we need to create all those um, all those incentives. And last but not least, uh, develop capabilities to operate on a regional basis and strengthen our profile um, as a credible partner regionally, uh, potentially clustering with Poland or other countries. So that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Bogdan. Uh, we have 10 billions to spend in the next 10 years. We have huge opportunities. So the data provided by Bogdan Belchu were extremely valuable. And I will ask uh, Arnold Dupi, a professor at Virginia Tech and George Mason University, how can we apply better this 2% of the GDP, considering that the US is the best example of uh, developing both military and civilian industry when we are talking about procurement programs like Bogdan presented in his speech? Please, Arnold. I think one of the best ways we can we can uh, apply this two percent, and, and I'll get to this in my presentation, is looking at the the broader uh, the broader holistic approach. I mean, not just looking at the the military aspects, but also how is that uh, or how is it supported by the infrastructure? How is it supported by both uh, economic and uh, and the political uh, environment? Uh, so this this is uh, I think two percent is is critical reaching that milestone for for a variety of reasons. Uh, but the best way of looking at looking at the the, the the critical weapon systems, but also the the logistics, looking at the uh, looking at the uh, other aspects that support this this overall uh, this overall uh, goal of yours, of all of us, I should say. Can we use a kind of uh, U.S. experience in terms of increasing? Um, the defense budget because we are used in the last 27 years to decrease the defense budget and now it's a huge provocation for the MOD and other structures to spend those monies because 
everybody says, okay, we have a lot of money, we have a program, we have uh, the desire to do more, but we are not used to spend those money. And um, somehow the US experience could be uh, extremely important. Can you provide something about that? I think the US experience is, that was developed over many decades. So I think you know, this is through, through trial and error, through effort, uh, identifying key areas where it needs to be, where it needs to be applied. Um, there also has to be the, the political will to, to do this. I mean, it, quite often it's, it's very painful because you have to generate these revenues. Uh, again, the, and there's also a, a key component to the US experience is this, this uh, alliance with academia, with the private sector, and the government all working together for you know, a, a common goal, which in this case could be uh, different types of weapon systems, different uh, technological uh, aspects of, of defense. So um, I think harnessing the, uh, what I call a triad, the government, uh, academia, and the private sector, all in a, a unified and concerted effort uh, is probably one of the best lessons that could be, that could be learned uh, in, in that regard. An example being uh, what Silicon Valley uh, has been able to contribute over, over the last several decades in this regard. Uh, again, we have, uh, again, a very clear, uh, you know, Stanford University, St the, 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 the tremendous academic institutes in the, in the area, the, the, the San Francisco area, the, uh, private sector, and also the, 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 government, the, the government demand has all, all driven this, this uh, tremendous, uh, um, this, this tremendous uh, growth in, in, the, uh, in the technological sector for, for this app. This application. I will ask uh, Stephen Flanagan, what is the main purpose of this 2% of the GDP inside NATO? It's only a military empowering or it must be something else also? Well, if you, if you look back at the history of this, the, it's, it's, it is, I mean, the answer to the question that was posed to us, it is a political necessity in the current context because it is a commitment that has been made as a measure of seriousness of purpose from all of our governments about are, are you really willing to take you know on your fair share of the burden and in the context of the current political debate which of course is is not new it has been continuing uh, the, the last two administrations also were pushing Europe to do more uh, and to show resolve but it was also a question of how was that money being spent um, the two percent has always been an imperfect measure but it is it is a measure of a certain degree of seriousness of, of commitment and purpose um, there was a lot of discussion back in 2009-10 about coming up with other metrics. Uh, the Dutch and some other governments were working on some more output-oriented metrics that could look at how could you measure, I mean, if, if you're not spending wisely or if you're not spending effectively, you could, spend, you could waste a lot of money and not get more capacity at a time when uh, the alliance was realizing that, um, that the, the spending was, you know, we had forces that weren't very ready. In a lot of European countries, we had forces that weren't mobile. Uh, we've had forces that, um, uh, you know, could not sustain themselves at any kind of distance at a time when we knew we are going to be moving to expeditionary operations first in Afghanistan and elsewhere, but, uh, and now, uh, you know, within the NATO region. So it's, um, I think it has to be looked at in the context of some of the other important commitments that we forget that the Alliance has also made, um, that uh, the Wales commitment of, of uh, defense investment of up to 20 percent of that new spending should be put towards defense investment and not on personnel and, and other uh, expenditures to look at ways to improve the allocation of resources within uh, each nation's defense spending uh, and to meet that 20% goal. Um, I think there's gonna be an initiative emerging in this uh, Brussels summit on a, ready, a readiness uh, initiative that will uh, also look at how have we moved uh, I mean, some of the readiness commitments in NATO or to have at least, you know, a 30% of your force deployable uh, within a certain number of days. Uh, I, I, you know, I hadn't gone back and had a chance to look at all of the history of this, but I think some of these commitments go back to the 2006 Riga summit about uh, having sustainability, uh, having de deployability uh, uh, measures um, and, uh, and which, you know, have not really been met because we still have, uh, when you look at the uh, VJ, uh, VJTF and the other highly ready forces, even those are not necessarily meeting some of their goals uh, in terms of readiness uh, and capacity to sustain themselves once they do move. So I, I think that, um, that we have to look at this all in the context of these other um, 
uh, these other commitments about how this, how that, how those, it was implicit in, in your opening question, how is that money being spent? If, 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 if governments do, for the most part, do seem on this track to in, in, increase uh, spending uh, uh, up to that 2%, those who aren't meeting it, uh, for the most part, uh, that how, how are they gonna actually invest those, uh, those uh, resources and what kind of input it's gonna have? And then it ties this back to the first presentation, how can that also have a, a, a positive effect on, on, on the economies of uh, the various member states? I want to ask Bogdan uh, what should be uh, uh, Romania's example on um, um, spending the, those 2% of the GDP. Stephen said we have to uh, take into account that 40% of the 2% of the GDP should be on procurement. And that means that in Romania's case, we will have 1 billion euro per year to spend in the next 10 years, which means 10 billions. We saw on a BSDA uh, 40 US and European companies for the first time, one of the biggest names in, in the world market and defense companies. But the offset arrangements and the technology transfer in Romania are not working that good because you mentioned that we have a lot of opportunities, but it seems that we are not uh, having this, uh, um, let's say, uh, opportunity to have new technologies and offset arrangements. Uh, how can be done on, on an uh, allied example, not only in Romania? I think uh, you know, we can start with the example of the um, consumption in Romania. So if you look at the past couple of years, two, three years, we had a significant boost in consumption, which drove the economic growth. And uh, funny enough, the more we consume, the more we import. Because really, the amount uh, that we produce in Romania, across the board, starting from meat to milk to manufactured products and so on, is relatively small. So this, um, you know, all that money which are flowing into the economy are mostly going into retailers, but very little into manufacturing and into value added. We need to avoid that to happen with the military expenses. 10 billion is a quite substantial am amount. Uh, that 10 billion could be a net spent, so could be out of, you know, everybody's pocket from the taxpayer's money. Uh, or we can offset a good part of that 10 million, encouraging or optimizing uh, the amount of uh, uh, spend uh, which stays in Romania. Um, production, local production, uh, through offset contracts, through transfer of technology and so on. And um, uh, frankly speaking, of course, uh, the US example is very far away from us. Even Germany and France are relatively far away from us. But I think the best example is Poland. So Poland is a country that many people see as being, you know, five, uh, we used to say is five years ahead of us, probably now is approaching more to 10. But definitely, if we are to take an example, then we should take the example of Poland. Uh, and we should find the means to encourage the uh, further development of the clusters. So we do have uh, a certain base. Uh, and if you, you know, if you remember the Polish example, they were not very far away themselves a few years ago but they manage, you know, 10, 15 years time horizon because things are not happening overnight, but they manage to turn that to have a significant multiplier effect and to transform that in really generating value for the, um, uh, for the, um, for the country overall. So our 2% uh, spend could actually be, you know, less than 1% or if you are, you know, if we manage to play our cards, cards properly. Arnold, um the military are increasing the presence on the eastern flank, which is a good sign. And the Congress, the US Congress approved uh, more and more spendings for this initiative. Could be this excellent example of defending the eastern flank and on allied presence from Estonia to Bulgaria as an example for the big defense companies when we are talking about 2% of the GDP, can the civilian and the uh, uh, companies and uh, the economics bring the example from the military cooperation? I mean, if we defend the Eastern flank, then we take 2% of the GDP, then we need technology transfer, and we need more and more US and European presence with big defense companies on the Eastern flank. Mm -hmm. That could be uh, uh, a good example taken from the military to civilian. Do you agree? Agreed. I mean, there's there, having a, uh, 
a military uh, service company or uh, provider uh, operating in, in your country can, can bring in, again, investment, brings in employment. So I, if I understand your question, it, it's, I see this as a positive development uh, driven by this 2% uh, GDP uh, goal. Uh, so the, the question is how do you track that? And then you know, it could be uh, uh, through, through whatever procurement means you have necessary to, to do this. Uh, but again, this, this is a way of developing this infrastructure that you're talking about, and looking at the Polish, uh, Polish example, uh, attracting these, these companies, attracting could be uh, European or Western European or, or U.S. companies, attracting them through, uh, through, uh, through whatever uh, procurement or contract uh, efforts that you have, uh, bringing them in through, through uh, teaming arrangements, whatever, and, and, and uh, applying them and, and giving them a location to work and to, uh, to develop uh, you know, without, his, without any uh, serious hindrance from, uh, from the government or any other external sources. Yes, Stephen, this 2% of the GDP is balancing from military threats from economic needs of those countries. So uh, where should be the balance between those two? Because the threats are here. We are facing uh, the storm that we are talking about 10 years ago. And there's a competition between the military threats that we are facing, especially here in the northern eastern flank on the Black Sea region, and the economic needs. All the companies from Poland, from Romania, from Croatia, everywhere, they are trying to take as much as they can from this 2% of the GDP, which is a defense percentage. So where should be the balance between the needs for the military threats and the economic needs? Well, I mean, I, mean, I don't think there's one size fits all that can be articulated for, uh, you know, all of the allies in Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, it obviously, there's a broad range of, of health of economies and, and sustainability of some of this. Uh, so I, I don't... I, don't, I can't think of a, a, a broad, you know, a broad. I think this a, those are national decisions that have to be made in the context of national politics and and the uh, uh, and the, the, the nature of, of, of those economies. Um, what I do think, though, is that you need to look at the balance of portfolio, even within the security sector, um, as a number of governments have done. The British have moved to this defense and security review. Um, others have tried to look at this in a more holistic way, as we talk about about the uh, need to look at, uh, at security in the full spectrum across the whole range of governmental threats. Uh, due to UNESCO is referring to some of this on strengthening resilience. Um, I think you have to look at a balance of, of some of the things that are, you know, both the threats that, to social cohesion and, and to, uh, you know, through, uh, um, that we see through uh, disinformation campaigns of interference in elections, all these things, all of that had to be, ought to be viewed as part of that as, and, and countering cyber threats, other things, uh, should be, you know, there should be a balanced portfolio as we, as we look at how that spending can, and some of those will have uh, impacts, I'm sure, in other, in other sectors if you look at, at, at spending on, on cyber security, social media uh, protections, other kinds of things like that that are going to have uh, ripple effects across the economy. But, um, uh, but you know, in terms of the, uh, you know, guns versus butter debate, I mean, I think that's, that's obviously something that has to take place in the context of, of national political consensus and about where they think the health of the economy is, where are the major shortfalls in other parts of social cohesion or, or, um, or social stability within in, in, in different member states. There, uh, you know, there's no, I don't think there's any one formula that I could point to. Thank you. I want to have some uh, time for the questions. Are there any questions? Please. Over here. My name is Kalim Panta. Thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I would like to zoom in more than what you did on the 2%. You say 2% uh, for um, defense, of which about 40% for new investments each year. And I think it's more than 1 billion euro per year if you consider the, the increase expected by GDP. I would go further to zoom in and I would, uh, uh, I would take from uh, Mr. Belchu presentation, which would be the percentage from this 1 billion or 1 billion plus uh, euro that is 
dedicated to the research and development for defense by our ministry, by our government. And secondly, what, what will be the percentage from this amount that um, is allocated to the procurement from the Romanian defense industry? Because if you uh, follow the, uh, your uh, story with the Polish or the states, I think you will, if you will analyze the, these percentages for the research and the procurement from the national defense, you will be quite shocked, I think, if you compare with what happens to Romania. You mentioned that, that in 2016, um, uh, 100 million uh, on the defense um, Romanian industry. And if I take from Ancex, most of it is to exports. That means the Ministry of Defense is buying extremely, maybe 2% or even less from the Romanian industry. And I think on the research is far more than 1%. Thank you. Bogdan, Uliasen, please. No, I agree. So, I mean, to be honest, we uh, focus more on the case studies and what could Romania do rather than what Romania does now. Uh, because definitely, uh, you know, we are, to be honest, we are far away from, uh, from where we should be. Uh, it's true that um, uh, if you look at the, the budget split and how the money is spent, there is uh, relatively little money spent on actually on investments. And um, uh, more so, uh, in order to change that, this is why we said the, at the beginning, uh, the, uh, in order to change that and to transform it uh, both into a uh, really improving the defense but also encouraging the economy behind, uh, probably we need to rethink, uh, starting from policies, starting from the offsetting law, starting from the procurement strategy, starting from the budget allocation, and then going into how to attract those uh, uh, potential investors and so on. So many things need to be done. Therefore, probably we should look at more what, what needs to be done rather than uh, what has been uh, done so far. Please. Thank you. My name is Valentin Berka. I uh, <coughs> am from Craiova. Uh, European uh, Union, uh, within uh, Europe 2020 strategy, recommended 30% uh, uh, of uh, GDP uh, destined to research and development. Um, in Romania, uh, research and develop development is uh, uh, funding under 1%. Uh, till uh, three. 3%, 2% of GDP is going to uh, military. Uh, my questions, uh, my question is uh, how uh, could uh, obtain another 2% uh, for research and development? Um, I uh, <coughs> learned from Turkey. Uh, in Turkey, investment in research and development is uh, six, uh, seven percent of uh, GDP, and uh, we saw uh, what obtain um, Turkish industry with this uh, money. Another question is regarding uh, transport. We um, talk about uh, military mobility, but uh, we know what is the situation of uh, Romanian infrastructure. Uh, on railways, uh, the <coughs> commercial speed is uh, 40, uh, 45 kilometer per hour, 47, yeah. but um, we know the situation of um, airport. We could obtain uh, uh, resources for uh, increasing improvement of transport for, uh, from uh, European defense uh, funding for, for offset or uh, another resources. Thank you. Somehow is related to the resilience concept I, we are talking about. Stephen, can you tell us because both are, are, are related? So. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that that point was brought up because that's another. That's a third element. I didn't want to disrupt the flow of our conversation, but a third element of, of how are we spending those resources <laughs> is the question of infrastructure. And the recent Saber Guardian exercise here, I think, revealed a lot of the limitations on mobility, on infrastructure that needed to be, that need to be addressed and the lessons that were taken away from that, uh, you know, having seen a, a fairly robust exercise in this region um, uh, with, uh, r you know, river crossings, integration of air and, and, uh, and ground force activities um, and the movement of forces, 
uh, a recognition that, uh, you know, that uh, as you alluded to, the some of the infrastructure limitations here uh, that would restrict movement uh, both uh, in capacity but also in terms of, um, you know, certain existing uh, standards and practices that have to be adjusted. Um, there's been a lot of talk in some of the uh, um, efforts that have been gone on, going on uh, from the uh, uh, so-called Dragoon Rides, these uh, excursions that uh, the U.S. Army forces have been taking uh, through Northern Europe are recognizing that you might need some kind of military Schengen kind of arrangement to allow for certain movements uh, and expeditious movements of, of, of forces and, and, uh, and, uh, and supplies uh, in a crisis. Uh, uh, the fact that there aren't enough rail cars to go around for some of the heavy equipment movements that need to take place. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, that Deutsche Bahn used to have lots of, of flatbed trucks, that, uh, flatbed uh, cars that could move tanks, but when the Cold War ended, they didn't need them anymore. They sold them off for scrap. So where, where is all of the, where is all of this kind of um, uh, support structure going to come from to sustain the kind of uh, force movements that we might, uh, that we might need to see uh, either in this region or in northeastern Europe? Harold, you want to say? Yeah, I, I, uh, I like to address the resilient uh, aspect a little bit more deeply. And in fact, I have a, a short presentation. Is that uh, yes, just a good time yes, to do it? Yes, please do. Great. Okay. Can I have the, uh, the clicker? Yeah. Set that. Thank you. So, what uh, we talked a little bit earlier, and Merce had mentioned the porcupine defense, and Steve mentioned it. So, I want to talk about um, resilience, in this case, energy security. So, we're talking so talk about feeding the porcupine. Uh, in this case, uh, energy security as a, a uh, Remaining energy security as a as a key to Black Sea security. So I want to quickly go through this uh, again. Quick disclaimer: While I work at the Pentagon, I'm not a government employee. I th so these are my own personal views. Um, so again, looking at the uh, the theme, the two percent uh, GDP, whether it's a political uh, will political fetish or a necessity, uh, I think it is definitely a necessity. Uh, as this, the the two percent GDP buys basically the uh, security foundation upon which the rest of civil society uh, rests upon. However, I think we need to look at it in a broader perspective, and that's what I mentioned earlier when I was talking to, to Radu. Uh, but this, we look at this from a political and from an economic standpoint, much more broader perspective. And I want to focus more on Romania's position. This, this, the uh, aspect of, I see Romania's energy security uh, position as a, from a relative position of strength, generally positive, within generally positive transatlantic relations, I realize um, the tariff issue, and the, the, these are, I see these as, as temporary uh, setbacks or temporary uh, uh, bumps in the road. Uh, I think the, uh, the general uh, uh, Atlantic alliance, alliance and, and foundation is, is still solid and will continue to be so. Uh, and then, of course, th we've discussed uh, throughout this morning, Romania's uh, geostrategic location and the value that that brings to the table. So. I'm going to start off with a few maps, again, looking at the, basically a, a foundational aspect of this, what I call the redistribution of power in Europe. And this is, a, I'm sure everybody's familiar with this map, how over the period of the post-Cold War period, we've seen uh, NATO shift from, from, uh, from west to east. Uh, again, that has uh, brought quite a bit of alarm from Russia, and we're seeing pushback now. But again, as uh, I'm still amazed at this map when, uh, when I first joined the Army in 1981, this would have been inconceivable to, to myself and almost anyone at the time, but here we are. So this is this is what we're working with as a, as a uh, as a uh, as an environment to to, to operate in. Uh, another in interesting aspect, and again within this theme of the redistribution of power, uh, the uh, the military uh, joint the military exercises, as Steve was just mentioning, the value that we have. I see two two main points in this. One is again the the focus of interoperability, the value that we get from familiarity with, with our NATO allies, training and, and maintaining that, that proficiency, but also these joint exercises provide a very uh, very potent uh, political statement of solidarity between NATO, NATO allies and, and uh, other, other uh, partners in, in the region. Just wanted to, to quickly bring this, we, we've mentioned the, the, the three C's. I like this because it shows a fairly uh, condensed and fairly uh, Easily, easy recognizable uh, way of, of addressing Eastern Europe. And you see, I've, this is, came from The Economist, but it, it shows the, uh, the, the gas pipelines, which again is very much of a, a, 
a political, uh, political statement. This is probably my favorite map because looking at uh, the, the Western uh, footprint, uh, what I see here, and we talked, you know, again, referencing the, the porcupine defense, the porcupine posture, but I also see in, in uh, the, what I call the, the Eastern anchors, Romania and Poland as, their, as the anchors, being the largest in land mass, uh, large uh, NATO forces, U.S. commitment of, of troops in these countries. So these, these hold, uh, uh, I think, very, very valuable positions and also a very valuable position regarding uh, energy and also the broader Black Sea security. So again, so I put those maps up there for some background, talk about feeding the porcupine and then ensuring that he is fed. So once you put this, you know, this forward deployed environment, you've got hardened assets and so on, uh, that's great, but how, you know, what does it mean? You just can't walk away from it. You have to maintain it and, and keep it supplied. So. I do, if I'm running out of time, let me know, because I'll speed up, and I, I do want to try and go through this pretty quickly, but uh, let's let me know if I'm, uh, so again, we noticed that the, there's a, a strong dependence on Eastern European nations on Russian, uh, on Russian energy, primarily gas and crude. Uh, Romania is in a better position because of its uh, traditional, uh, traditional uh, infrastructure that's been in, in place for well over 100 years. Uh, I like this map because it depicts a, uh, it shows uh, visually the, the levels of uh, dependence on Russian gas, in this case, it's using gas as an example. Uh, the Baltic states heavily dependent, Central European. Uh, look, R Romania is in a good position, so I see that as a relative position of strength going forward. However, there, there are challenges to this. You know, obviously, the, the choke points that Romania has to, to work with, uh, work within the Turkish Straits and various uh, other choke points within the Mediterranean. So the idea may be, do we look at this from coming in through the back door through the Adriatic? Uh, that presents another various uh, challenges. You know, let me get this thing figured out here. Uh, looking at LNG terminals, the existing one in the Adriatic, the one that's proposed, but again, you have a question of how do you ship this, this whether it's LNG or, or crude, how do you ship it effectively across the, the rough terrain of the Western Balkans, the multiple uh, political boundaries, how do you make that happen? Again, so there's no, no easy answer to this, how to feed the porcupine. So a couple, uh, again, here we get to the, to the resilience aspect and how this factors into the, uh, the, the 2%. Uh, looking at Romanian energy as a, from a security leadership position, then these, I have five points. I can, uh, I, every country will have to deal with this. Romania is in some position of strength in, in certain areas and, and, and some not. But uh, looking at this from the, uh, the first one, the, diversing the, uh, the, the source infrastructure, increased, for instance, increased storage capacity. Uh, example being, as we see more uh, military interest from the United States and NATO in Romania, this demand will certainly increase market liberalization, uh, improved investment climate. Uh, and I just wanted to, uh, as an example, uh, ensuring that uh, the, the, the commercial sector has a, uh, a, a clear view, a clear, clear uh, uh, some clarity in how the, uh, the laws are, are uh, in, in imposed and implemented. I bring up the draft offshore law, which I believe is still, uh, still pending. Uh, something I always like to emphasize is the cyber aspect, not, no, not necessarily from a uh, information, but also from a physical asset. Physical uh, industrial control systems, uh, particularly in the energy sector, are all very vulnerable to this. Looking at uh, the nexus of military energy and military security and energy security, how that, how that uh, needs to be addressed. And then finally, the, uh, the, the influence of disinformation and how that, uh, how that can be, uh, how can that have a, a very significant uh, physical as uh, impact on, uh, just on, on general civilian and military operations. So the, the bottom line is coming down to enhanced resilience. So am I good for time or do you want me to? Yeah, thank you Arnold, very interesting. We have time for one more question. So if there are no questions, then uh, I will thank all the speakers. Yeah? So please, Adrian. 
Adrian Eco, please. So, Tell us how no. to feed the porcupine. So, yeah, no. You, you spoke about wise and unwise acquisition. It is against the criterion. Could you give us some example wise and or unwise decision for acquisition? I didn't answer, I hear the question. What was that again, please? What is? The way uh, we talked here about the wise and unwise. A wise and unwise decision. And unwise. Yes. So do you have an example not of wise and unwise decision? Spending, wise spending, unwise spending. So okay, if wise and unwise is against the criterion, could you define the criterion or at least give us examples of wise and unwise decisions? <laughs> you said something about the wise and unwise investments. Could you give examples about wise and unwise investments? Well, whatever, in order to support the mission, I mean, you have uh, uh, making sure that the that the uh, that the investments are geared towards a specific product for a specific uh, uh, requirement that comes up from the military from the military. Uh, so, um, example could be uh, on extra storage for for fuel, for instance, as opposed to. Um, additional refineries, for instance. Again, I'm just making up, making up an example. Refineries and also, I can give you bad examples of uh, building stadiums uh, uh, and not building highways. Trubaco, if Aerostar would be a partner of Lockheed Martin, Adrian. Yes, speaking about defense. So, uh, Mircea, can you tell us 30 seconds about? Stephen, please. Investment. The issue of, uh, and, and Arnold, Arnold alluded to it too, the investments that you've seen in the United States of, of investing in innovative technologies, the so-called third offset strategy, uh, some of these ways in which you can leverage, uh, and, you know, even even within your investments in defense, uh, uh, you know, d uh, d defense modernization and improvement, the way those are allocated uh, and looking at new technologies that may produce uh, uh, greater force multipliers uh, for, for the investment. Um, so, uh, you know, new approaches to uh, aspects of, of defense of, of ships or uh, movement use of, you know, we talked earlier about uh, the innovative uses of unmanned vehicles, both aer aerial and underwater, uh, that can be used in, in ways to leverage certain capabilities. So I think that's another example of some of the kinds of uh, uh, prudent spending that you can make uh, as, you, as you look at how this, this uh, uh, these resources are being allocated, but the but the generals, you know, I think the general thrust w of the debate within NATO has been, over the last few years, is that making sure that countries are are, are not, um, uh, you know, are are investing in the kinds of things that will give the kind of mobility and sustainment uh, to the forces that, uh, and at least a certain percentage of those, and that might, you know, that might require some restructuring of the forces themselves. To enable, you know, to enable to sustain that within the existing resources uh, uh, that are available. Thank you. So the time is up. I want to thank everybody for this uh, excellent panel, Bogdan, Stephen, and Arnold. Then we have the lunch break. Thank you.